Hi, I'm Diane McGarry with Drake at Arts. We're so excited here. to be sharing our artists with you today. <laughs> Join us now as author Maureen Cavanaugh is here. Um, she's written an incredible story called If You Loved Me, A Mother's Journey Through Her Daughter's Addiction and Recovery. Maureen is a national public speaker on the opioid crisis and its impact on the family. She co-hosts the Cod Past, Cod Past Collateral Damage and is the founder of Magnolia New Beginnings, a national nonprofit peer support group for those living with or affected by substance use disorder. New York Times, CNN, and other outlets have recognized her for her work fighting the opioid crisis and the stigma that surrounds it. She holds a master's degree in education as well as a master's in public administration. She is an invent <laughs> interventionist, recovery coach um, trainer, and she's a family recovery coach in private practice at Magnolia Recovery and Consulting. And she trains families and professionals on her family-focused addiction support training program, which educates on parent perspective of addiction. We do have a separate program on drug addiction that we've recorded earlier that can be seen on Drake at Arts YouTube and also Drake at Access TV on demand. Maureen, thank you so much for joining us for this author's reading today. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me um, to both of you, Diane, Tom, the Drake at Arts. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll be speaking today about the, my book, If You Love Me, as you said, but uh, I'll also be speaking about the subject that's become more the, of a calling than a job for me over the last decade, and that's family recovery. I was like many other people, a person who had um, being published on their bucket list um, nowhere on that list was to live a life worthy of a memoir. I thought I would get to make things up maybe one day and publish a book. I didn't really had any, I didn't have any desire to live a life that, you know, that was worth a book. Matter of fact, I had attended seminars and workshops at the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown and written and even been published in small ways, newspaper articles and such throughout my life. But when I was approached by a literary agent, about initially a New York Times reporter, Kit Seeley, writing a book about this part of my life. And then when she found that um, she was not able to do it because of a conflict of interest, because she was the New England bureau chief and had written several stories about what I was, what I was doing and um, my story, um, I, I asked the agent if I could write the book. And oh. you know, a literary agent is a very difficult thing to, to um, you know, have have uh, active in in your book, and it's what everybody wants. So when I asked him if I could write a book, I always say I could hear his eyes roll over the phone. Yeah, um, yeah he was. Um, I, I was. It was probably you know his worst nightmare is somebody saying, "Oh, I can write the book," but we went back and forth a little bit, and I can write. So I would have just. I'm not sure I would have ever had the opportunity to have an agent like that. Um, so I, I, you know, started to, after now I promised to write this book. Now I said I could do it. I had to do it. And it was, oh. it was um, in the middle of what I was going through with my daughter that I, I started to Ooh. write every single morning. Um, so I'm going to just see if I can do this because like everybody else, I'm having fun and games with, um, with Zoom as well. So hopefully you can see that. And um I'm just going to share a little bit about, because I think that pictures are so much easier than words sometimes to, to tell a little bit of a more of the story. Um, We're not so, seeing the slide, though. We're seeing a dialogue. Oh, are you really? Okay, well, let's try this again then. Um, let's see. I'd gotten so good at this, too, that I got smug. <laughs> That's okay. Let's see. It's telling us it's it's your script. You're seeing your yeah, it's, it's, it's it is. It's my notes. So let's see. Um, let's try this again. Oh, there we go. We're swimming. Nice background. Yeah. <laughs> if that was only my life, if I was swimming, that would be awesome. Oh, wait a minute. I think I got this now. See, I told you not to worry. So we'll stop the share. And um, I'm going to try this one more time. No problem. We were snorkeling on our honeymoon. That was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. There we go. Okay, now we're going. I think it's. The How's that? Day. 
There we go. There's there we go. Okay. I knew I could do it. So this was kind of, you know, what my life looked like in 1993. Oh, wow. Okay. I had, a, you know, a perfect child and actually I had four perfect children. At that point, I only had, I only had three. And, you know, like everybody else does, I had my, you know, a, just a typically ordinary life. Um, Katie was probably the easiest of all my children. She mm. was such a, she was very, very sweet always and was always my buddy. Um, when she was about this age, maybe a little bit older, I always tell the story because I like to give you like kind of an idea of who she is. Um, she, um, my mother had passed away and I have a very small family and I had, um, you know, told my older children first. And then I told my, my younger two children, my, my son was much, was really too young to understand. It didn't really know my mother that well anyhow, but Katie looked up kind of with that little sweet face and said, Oh, mommy, if I'm this upset, imagine how you must feel. And this oh. is like at five years old. Wow. So she was always that kind of kid, you know, that very kind, loving uh, type of kid. Um, like I said, my life was ordinary. And in, in, we moved to Marblehead. I had, you know, gotten divorced. My ex-husband and I were very close, but um, I moved to Marblehead, tried to give them sort of the, the perfect life like we all try to do. Um, and um, she did well in school. She wanted to be a special education teacher like, like I was. And I lived across the school from the, uh, across the street from the school I was teaching. I started a nonprofit. The goal of the nonprofit was to help people needing a fresh start. She was very much like me. She volunteered, she worked, she went to school. And um, I, I knew that um, the nonprofit would deal with many people in recovery because it was trying to give people a fresh start. I didn't anticipate it being the sole focus would be people in recovery because that was not something that was on my radar at that point. Um, but, you know, uh, I had come from a family where everyone was addicted to something. And I'm ashamed to say that for a long time, I thought I was stronger than anybody in my family. Of course, that would change. As a matter of fact, everything would change and it would happen very quickly. Katie went off to college and experimenting. She was drinking a little bit, I guess, in high school that I didn't even really know about, turned into a heroin addiction. And it happened right in front of me. I didn't see the severity of it, couldn't reconcile this perfect human being with the disease I knew too much and also nothing about. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit and I'm going to read from the book. I'm not sure how I get into the car, but I know I'm on my way to kill Bob. I don't want to take my eyes off the road because I'm feeling unsteady and it's important I get there. I don't want to miss him. A few minutes can make all the difference. I can see him in my mind's eye, the bat cracking across his skull. I won't stop there. I will beat him, a man twice my size, in front of whoever is there, despite his cries for mercy over and over until he stops moving, stops crying out, stops destroying my beautiful Katie. I won't quit until he isn't breathing. Then I will spit on him, something I've never even considered doing to anyone in my 54 years of life. I will do all of this and I will never have a moment's guilt over it. I reach over and touch the top of the bat. This is long overdue. The calm exterior that the world sees is about to shatter. This last chain of events has broken something. I know what I need to do and I can't remember the last time during this horror show of the past two years when I was so clear about anything. So many unanswered questions, so many late night pleas to God, so many theories about what I did wrong. It's a relief to finally have an answer, even this one. I feel as if the bat is also begging to kill Bob. It is my son Liam's bat, the golden child his brother and sisters call him half jokingly. I'm lost in thought, the last days, the last of the day's sun slowly fading into dusk and I stop abruptly at a crosswalk, my arm accidentally hitting the car horn. It startles me, as well as the woman crossing the street. She glares at me. Relax, lady. I notice that her coat is buttoned incorrectly, so that her entire front is askew. 
with the right side of the garment riding high above the left. She's limping to the same side. I think Picasso put her together. Mm. I mouth the words, I'm sorry. And she quickens her step, pulling something out of her purse. She doesn't understand what I'm saying, so I roll down the window. I'm sorry, I say. She begins to scream. I'm writing your license plate down. I'm going to the police. I'm going to the police. Is everyone walking around just about to snap? I wonder if most people are just holding on to themselves by a thread. I'm grateful for being so calm. The thought that often strikes me nowadays is how little we know about what goes on in the lives of others. The face we show to the world is rarely the one we wear in private. It's been so very long since I felt anything other than heartbroken that I'm pretty convinced it's never been any other way. I looked down at my body, 20 pounds heavier. The doctor had warned me about that two years ago when I started to take a daily 50 milligrams of Zoloft for the paralyzing anxiety that looked a lot like sadness. But somehow that weight still snuck up on me. It's not the small pill causing the gains, I know that. It's my secret relationship with Ben and Jerry. Mm. Nothing other than peanut butter cup will do. And I've hunted through store after store until I find it. Then I go home, climb into bed, watch a sitcom with a laugh track and comfort myself with on-demand mindlessness and empty calories. It could be worse, I tell myself. I know this is true because I've seen much, much worse. I've seen so much pain in the last few years. I hadn't known just how much pain the world could contain. It crushes me sometimes, not just my own, but the pain of so many others also trying to hang on to whatever shred of their loved ones that they can. I don't know how I got here. There is never a day that goes by that this does not feel surreal. I can't save my daughter, Katie, and sometimes that feels like the only certainty in my life. I can't make her stop using drugs any more than I could keep her from leaving any of the over 40 treatment centers she has left or safeguard her from the double digit number of overdoses. I finally come to the realization that there is nothing I can say or do that will make a real difference. She's going to leave the facility she's in now. And I know that because she has called and told me so. I tried to talk her out of it, saying all of the things I've said a thousand times before, the things that have helped a hundred people before her, but I could hear the venom in her voice. Some switches flipped and she's ready to run. Not the first time, but I know it could be the last. This will be one of several treatment centers where she has been doing well, and suddenly she decides to leave, courtesy of a 56-year-old piece of shit named Bob. Huh. I'm drifting to one side of the road when my phone rings and snaps me back to attention. I hope for a brief second that it will, it'll be the call, the one that I've dreamed about that will tell me this is all a mistake, nothing to worry about, go home and eat your ice cream. And when I realize that isn't happening, I wonder briefly if people on the way to kill someone answer the phone. There really isn't a rule book or protocol for this. So I reach for it and study the name of the caller. So wow. that's how fastly, how, how quickly, how fast, how fast we went from um, high school honor student graduation, wanting to be a special education teacher to um, some really dark, dark times. Um, in the middle of that, um, I started Magnolia because I saw so many gaps because as, as difficult and awful as my situation was, I found that, um, I saw other people that were in so much worse shape. They didn't have the health insurance that they, that I, that we had. They didn't, I was working for myself at this point when all this was going on and I ran my business right into the ground, but I still was able to be there and and manage and manage. There are a lot of people that can't even do that. Um, I also was very fortunate that my ex-husband and I uh, were the best of friends. So we were able to, to, you know, tackle this together, not in the beginning, but we really became um, a united front throughout this. And uh, I, so I was very lucky to have that. And I saw so many people that didn't have that. I was also always one of those, these people that, um, if I didn't know something, I would educate myself mm. and I would research and research and ask the same question to 20 different people. And eventually I would, I would have answers, but I, I, and it's almost seemed like the trauma and the stress of this gave me more energy to do that because yeah. then I didn't have to look at what was going on so much, you know, so maybe an unhealthy coping mechanism, but um, it, 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 
it served me and it also made it so that I, I could not, you know, I, I couldn't directly help my daughter, but now I knew so much I wanted to share it. Right. And I didn't want, I wanted people to start from the point where I was and not have to spend, you know, two years getting there. So when I, when I started um, Magnolia, I also started support groups online. And um, we have about 25,000 members now in those support oh. groups all across the country. And in November, um, in the beginning of December, um, November 22nd is our first meeting. And then on, the, in, on December 3rd and 7th, which is the Thursday and Sunday, we're gonna be launching Zoom meetings, uh, family support meetings. So, and that's gonna grow too, because I, I watched during this, the last shutdown and, and COVID, how desperate the situation got for people again. It was almost like before there was anything. So when I was going through this at this particular time, there was very little out there for parents. Um, there'd be, you know, maybe a learn to cope meeting or an Al-Anon meeting, but you'd have to be in the right area and it would have to be at your, at, you know, one, the night that you can make it. And we're lucky in Massachusetts. There were places or in the rest of the country where you go and people are still afraid to talk about this. Huh. So, um, and here too, I mean, I'm just, what happened is my daughter was very publicly outed in the newspaper and that's in the book too, but um, as, as what was going on in her life and it took her down the tubes, but it also made me unafraid to talk about it. There was nothing to hide anymore. Sure. So um, I thought I was protecting her by being quiet, but I was, it wasn't the right thing for either one of us. I just didn't realize that. And um, so I started to come out and talk about this and talk about this. And that's how we're going to change the shame and the stigma that goes along with this is by being very vocal about it. Um, so there's nothing that can prepare a parent for this experience, but there's few things worse than going through it uneducated on substance use disorder and unsupported. So I'm trying, still trying to change that and make changes to that. Um, we, um, you know, I never knew from one day to the next what was going on with her. It was it was really truly a nightmare. Um, she went from somebody who was um, excited about her future to somebody who was going in and out of treatment. And that's I mean, that's yeah, that's how different if that was before and after like that's after 28 days. So she was going in and out of treatment so many times that, uh, I mean, I don't think anybody could keep up with it. Um, people that were in, um, that I had become close to started to tell me that I, um, I needed to be realistic and that this was not going to end well. And of course, as any mother, you know, it's, nobody wants to hear that. Um, but as many times as she had overdosed 13 that brought it to the hospital. I mean, probably another 13 or 20 that didn't bring her to the hospital that where she didn't go to the hospital. It seemed like she was teetering on the brink of death for, you know, um, several times a week towards. Um, so this was just about towards the end of when she was going in and out. Um, I had learned so much, what a terrible way to have to learn something. I also found that um, there were so many people, even many people working in treatment that really didn't understand what it was like to go through this as a parent. And that's part of the reason that I wrote the book. I wanted people to understand what parents go through because they say that this is a family disease and it's very true because everybody in the family goes down when, someone, when someone's this impacted by, by a substance use disorder. And um, when you have somebody who, who you love desperately going, you know, teetering between life and death, this is not, um, you know, nothing, nobody remains unchanged. This, if this, this uh, impacted every single person in my family and uh, all the people around me. So I um, don't really understand why all these um, treatment centers that make millions and millions of dollars don't have family programs. And I'm before COVID was starting to teach my my um, it's called fast family addiction support training across the country. And then COVID came. But, you know, instead of doing that now, we're starting these family groups. And hopefully when this is over, I'll be back at it because I'm sorry, but I think these treatment centers owe us that. You know, <laughs> we are typically paying the bill for this yeah. and we're at least paying for the insurance. And um, and 
what happens is somebody goes into treatment and then they, um, even if they're doing fantastic and they're in there for typically 20, 28 days, but even if they have 60, 90 days, even a year, and then they come back and the family hasn't been treated. So everybody's white knuckling it, crossing their fingers and hoping that the person is okay. And um, what, and they come back to this family who's just as sick, sometimes sicker as they were before, because they, all they worried about, particularly when you have somebody is, who's in it for a short period of time, they haven't learned new coping skills. They haven't learned how to fight the parts of their brain that have been compromised because of stress and trauma and now are not functioning like they were before. And, and they've been traumatized too. So the, no one's helped them yet. And then they release this person who's been working on themselves for, for a month into this back into this family. And well, we screw them up all over again. And we don't do it on purpose, but we do it because we love them so much that we think we have to watch them and stare at them and help them help them. We help, help, help until we cripple them sometimes. So this is, and, but what, we don't know any better and no one's helping the family. So I wrote this book hope, hoping that we would, um, that people would start to understand what families go through and what need, and that we, we are part of this too, and that we need to be helped as well. And there's a few places doing it, but they're few and far between. So I hope to change that. That's really, I mean, a big part of um, why I shared so much, because I remember when the book was first delivered and, you know, you write your heart out and, um, and share the most intimate, you know, painful parts of your life. And then this big book gets delivered. And it was interesting because when I finished the book, a week after I finished the book, three of the top uh, six uh, publishers in the world were bidding for the book. So, I mean, so this is a story that needs to be told. I think I did a really good job with it. The audible version is, uh, was runner up for 2018 for memoir of the year. And my other runner up was Michelle Obama. So anytime I get to sit next to anything, anybody <laughs> like that as a runner up, I'm good. <laughs> and, um, so I think it was a, it's a powerful story that needs to be told because people who haven't gone through this need to read it because they need to understand that there are um, so, many, so many families affected by this. And we probably most likely didn't do anything any differently than you did. And we don't love our children any less than you do. There, but you know, there's, this is 50% inherited. So it's genetic. So even if you've done all the same things, you have a chance that this is gonna happen anyhow. And, um, you know, people are, are struggling to know what, what to do and there's nobody out there steering them. So when I wrote this book and it was delivered, I remember opening up the, um, the box and she was three days out of a treatment center when I finished the book. I opened it up and saw the cover looking back at me and thought to myself, oh my God, what did I do? <laughs> because now it's out there, you know? But it's turned out to be a, a really, truly wonderful thing that I get letters from people all the time um, telling me that it's helped them. I get letters from people telling me that um, it's inspired them to get into treatment, to reconnect with their families, to understand their, their loved one and, and reach out to them and be more empathetic. So I think that, and to connect with Magnolia, which is, it, that's, that's golden, you know, when, when people find other people that can support them. So I'm, I'm thrilled that the book is out there and that the story is out there. I think that I wrote it in such a way that it reads more like fiction so that um, it's not, you know, and then this happened and then that happened, it, you know, where it's, it's really like you, you, you get in right there in that prologue that I just read and then you're along for the ride the whole time. And you have to keep reminding yourself that this is, um, this is, a, you know, a true story, I think, because it's, it's, it's tough, but it's funny too. And I try really hard to be humorous, which is how I conduct my life because I would have lost my marbles completely. Notice I say completely. Um, <laughs> if I, if I didn't have a great sense of humor and I wasn't able to, um, to find some of the, the humor in even this and even my ex-husband, thank God for him because he's also got the same kind of dark sense of humor that we all have in my family and was able to, um, was able to make, we were maybe able to make each other laugh throughout this, I'm not sure how. So um, would you like me to read a little bit more? 
Yes, that would be great. So I'm going to jump ahead. And like I said, she was in 40 different, 40 different entries. So this was at a time when she was actually doing better. Um, winter 2017. Hey, sweetie, how are you? I'm good, mommy. I'm going to a sober event with the rest of the people at the treatment center for New Year's Eve. So I'm trying to figure out what to wear. Well, that sounds pretty normal considering, huh? The reality is that Katie has been in some form of treatment for the holidays for the last three years, and this year is no exception. Each year, we hope that the next year will be different. We know that it could be worse, but the truth is that it's been a very long time since she was home and either not high or counting the moments until she can leave and get high. Yeah, I guess so. Better than last year. Hey, can I ask you for a favor? It's kind of big. No money, Katie. I can't do it, I respond, anticipating that she'll either ask for money or clothes. She has lost every type of article of clothing several times over, and I'm sick of replacing things for her. Along with that, she's borrowed <laughs> a lot of my clothes, items I'll never see again. No, Mom, it's not for me. Well, not directly. Can you help Gabe Wright? I told him you would, but he thinks you hate him. Gabe Wright. The person we blamed for getting Katie addicted to heroin. The person who first showed her how to use a needle. Mom, I take a deep breath, then another. If I believe, as I say I do, that this is a disease, that I cannot hold against Katie the things she has done when she was consumed by addiction, that every person deserves treatment, then I should help him. I need to put my money where my mouth is. Of course, I'll help him, Katie. Tell him to call me. I grab my old boyfriends, Ben and Jerry, out of the fridge and make a late lunch of a pint of peanut butter, peanut butter cup while I wait for the call. When I, pull up, when I pull up the open detox bed list on my phone, as I expected, there is nothing. It's two o'clock on Friday, December 30th, and I'm just about to leave for the Cape. Randy is waiting for me down there and we have plans. How the hell am I going to find Gabe help? Digging down into my mental list of contacts, I call a treatment center that does a great job with its mass health patients. The counselors, counselors there are understaffed, overworked, and underpaid, but they have an abundance of compassion. No fancy buildings or massage therapists, but a staff that cares. Plus, I've got a friend in admissions. I've made this contact because Magnolia helps the facility with sober living scholarships for some of its patients who complete the longer term programs. I call Judy on her cell and she answers right away. Hello, my friend, I say. Happy New Year. Oh, Lord, let's hope so, Judy answers. How are you? I'm good, but I have a friend who isn't doing so well. 26-year-old man, needs detox, heroin, mass health. Tell me you have a bed. How can I say no to you? How soon can you have him here? I'm going to pick him up as soon as he calls me, and I should be on the road in about 15 minutes. It will take me about two hours to get to you. Perfect. I'll wait for you. It will be good to see you. An unfamiliar number appear, appears on my caller ID. I answer on the first ring so I don't have to think about whether I want to let it go to voicemail. Hi, Maureen. I'm Katie's friend, Gabe. She said you could help me. Gabriel, right. Where are you now? There's traffic in the background as he answers. I'm in Salem. There are a few conditions, Gabe. You have to finish detox and then go on to the longer term program. I'm not helping you get sober if you're planning on leaving at, right after detox. That's just setting you up for an overdose, and I'm not doing that. In order to make that happen, you have to put me on your release and call me, because if you don't call me while you're in detox, I can't help you. You also have to pack your stuff up right now and be ready to go. Can you do that? There's quiet on the other end of the line, and I mistake it for disagreement, when in fact, it is disbelief that I'm going to help him. Everything I own is in my duffel bag on my back. I've been homeless for three months. If you help me, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. But if you could give me 20 minutes, I'd appreciate it. I can hear the pain and desperation in his voice. He is nothing like I expected. I want to cry, not only for him, but for all the misconceptions that I and others have about those who suffer with this disease. I picture his father at the back of the room in the Learn to Cope meetings and imagine Gabe as a child playing baseball, bringing home his spelling test, doing a cannonball into a pool. Okay, hon, I say, it's going to be okay. I have a bed for you tonight. It's a good place, but it's a couple of hours away, so we have to move quickly. I'm leaving in a few minutes. Tell me exactly where you are, and I'll be right there. 
I call Judy back and say that I'm on my way and that we'll be calling that I'll he will be calling in shortly. She can tell she can tell something is wrong. What's up? She asks. Oh, it's the kid my daughter first started shooting up with. I spent a long time blaming him and I just heard the voice of every kid who was suffering on the other end of the phone. We're on our way. He'll do the intake from the car. I'm about to cry and I don't have time for that. So I rush Judy off the phone. The light is fading and I'm going to get stuck in traffic on the way down. That I know. I throw my bag in the car and make my way into Salem. 10 minutes remain before I am to meet Gabe. Wasting time, I drive past 250 Washington and turn onto Derby Street. As I swing past the Salem Common, I glance up at the statue of Nathaniel Hawthorne. So I got an education too. I thought I knew everything. You know, you grow up in, in a family full of drugs and alcohol, and you think that if you get far enough away from it, that you won't ever have to deal with it. You also sometimes think that you, that you know everything. And um, I realized that I did not know nearly as much as I thought I knew. Your writings are so amazing to me. I mean, you you write and talk with such openness and also awareness of yourself. When I first read about the bat, I was like, oh my God, I hope she doesn't do it. But the intensity, what parent doesn't know the intensity of those feelings for their child? I mean, we are mother bears, right? We protect yeah. our children. And we do feel like we would kill for them, which is an unreasonable thing in our civilized society. But the feelings are there and that incredibly intense honesty. Just, you're right, it brings us all right in. And it um, it forever makes me want to cry because it's just, I'm so appreciative of you taking the time to share this story in the manner that you've shared it and the honesty and openness that you've brought to writing. You are an incredible author, Maureen. Thank you very much. Really. And it, your message is one of um, a struggle, right? You're, you are helping us all witness your humanity and the struggle that you go through. And it's, some of us will have substance use disorder. Some of us will have familiarity with it. Some of us won't, but we will all share intense struggles for our own self, really. And that's what you're talking about. And it, my mom was an alcoholic. She never got sober. Um, and it, as much as she was really an incredibly wonderful mom, she suffered from a very horrible disease. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of funny because I talk about that openly here. I grew up in New Jersey and sometimes I wonder about um, the openness, whether I would feel as comfortable being as open. With, and you, when you talk about it was already out there, so there was nothing I could hide anymore. It was already out in the open. So for me, it was just really telling my story so people could hear what I was experiencing and really know. And that that freedom of that, it everybody knows already. So you can either go with it and help people see you for who you really are as opposed to the image that they get from the content or from however someone has related the story, mm -hmm. you know, for Absolutely. better or for worse. Yeah. Or, you know, you can continue to hide and pretend it's not there or whatever, but... Um, what power and strength comes from being able to stand and say, yes, I'm walking this road. I don't want to be on this road. God forgive me for wanting to be on a different one, but I'm on this road. And this is how it feels to be here. This is how it is. Well, it couldn't just be pain. 
You know, I refuse to let it just be pain because this is probably, you know, watching anything happen to your child is, is, is incredibly painful, but this road that she went down and, and all the horrible traumatic things that happened to her while, while, you know, during that period to, to see that was, was heartbreaking and no one wants that for their child, but it goes something positive had to come out of this. And this was, this was the be this was how I, I could see contributing towards that. And um, I, I had, you know, I knew it would do good. I knew that sharing the story would do good. I never, ever imagined how much good it would do because especially that first, that prologue, there's not a mother that's gone through this that has not thought of those same things. Maybe I don't get in the car and try it. <laughs> But you didn't, you didn't, you, you went to the brink, but you were like, you still had your sanity. It, it's such well, only, only because I was, I was diverted. That was the only reason. Trust me when I tell you, because I believe you, but the, fer <laughs> the, the ferociousness of the love that you have for your daughter, the power of that love. I mean, to me, that's the saving grace again and again, you know, that, all right, I didn't want to help this person because He's the one that taught my, got my daughter into this, but I love her and I will do this for her. And then the humility of afterwards, he's just a kid. He's just as messed up as she is. And know? he's, he's such a good person. He really is. And that was 2017 and three years later, he's doing amazing. Uh -huh. So, I mean, people get better and then they get to be who they were supposed to be to begin with. Oh Yeah. And I'm very fortunate to be able to say that about Katie too. She's got a little over three years of, of recovery right now. It was a long, tough journey, but, and, and that's, if there's, if there's a, something to take away of, from the story, it's that people can wind up in the, in the worst situations where everybody, almost everybody gave up on her except for me and, um, and her dad, but, um, I don't think, I don't think many people, I don't think anybody aside from, I, I used to call myself delusionally optimistic. I just refuse to believe that she wasn't going to make it. I couldn't, I couldn't process that. No, so, you can't, because if you go there, then you're not going to be able to help sure. her. And if you go there, you would not really go in there anyhow, because I have, I, I carry around all the, the pictures of all of my close friends who have lost children. I carry their children's pictures with me as I do with the work that I do. And, um, and they'll, they'll be the first to tell you, no matter what they went through, they thought they imagined it. And you can't imagine how awful it is to lose a child unless you've lost a child. I so um, I, I mean, you know, and I, I thought I, I understood that it may happen and still, I'm sure I didn't have any conception, but um. Well, how can you possibly? Right. I mean, seriously, Maureen. You I mean, can't. Like, no, you can't. But I mean, I, I don't think anybody thought she was going to make it. I don't think anybody thought that she was going to make it. And yet she did. And she's more than made it. She's has a, a great life. Back to school. Good job. Just bought a new car. Um, you know, is is planning on, on going between being a nurse and a respiratory therapist. She's not sure what she wants to do. I mean, it's just it's staggering the difference in a little over three years. And this is what happens when we meet this disease with love, education, support, and connection. Yeah, oh. that's all any of us want is to be loved and to be recognized, to be seen and to be, to be held in relationship with someone else. Unfortunately, we're meeting it with, um, with the idea that people are, these people are disposable that they will never get well and we and we, that we really don't care that much about them. And I say that because all you have to do is look at what we have in place to help people. And you, that's, I, there's no other way to interpret it. So families need to come together and fight for our children, other people's children. This can't be, you know, we can't continue on this path because we had 72,000 overdoses, I think last year, God only knows what at deaths too, not just overdoses, God only knows what the overdose number is, but um, deaths in this country, and that's underreported. And that doesn't count all the things that, you know, uh, take a chip away at somebody's health. And that doesn't count alcohol either. No. So we're not talking about any of that. This is set 72,000. If anybody wants to imagine it is Gillette Stadium completely full. So That's what's how your many... model, Maureen? What's your model? 
if you don't like the system that's there now, what long term treatment? Long term treatment, and then a slow release into life, helping people with with housing, helping people with jobs and education. This is so what we need to what do. What do you mean when you say long term treatment? You mean lifetime treatment? You mean twelve months? What do, what does that mean for you? Right now, typically, what we do is. In, in Massachusetts, we're very fortunate. We have a medical detox that most people can get in for seven days. But if there's no room in the next step of treatment, the clinical stabilization, they're out on the street then. And I do mean on the street. And if yeah, you- Seven days isn't long enough to do anything. Nope, it's not even enough to detox with the drugs that are out there now. Because we talked about this before on our other program. You talked about how the brain has changed, right? And mm. it takes- what six months for the, the it all depends on the person and the severity of the of the of the disease but you're talking at least 90 days i would say you know really it's not even nine it's more like nine months minimum mm -hmm. you know but um by 18 months i started to see my daughter by nine by by nine months she seemed like she was round in the curve you know that it so was by long-term care you're really talking two years year or two definitely yeah i mean but it doesn't have to look the same for the two years no no i get that there's programs in italy there's a program in italy called um it's san patriano and they're they're a four-year program huh. and while they're there they live in community they learn a trade they um they slowly go back out into the into the into the community to practice that trade and then come back in and live in a supported environment and that's when people get well yeah but that's what you do when you care about somebody when you have a program like that in vermont too i can't remember the name of it but it's the same thing a long -term care treatment you come in it happens to be vegetarian but they do a lot of a lot of working with their hands their body their brain i mean they engage the all of the senses, all of the humanity, because I think a lot of us now, we forget that. And especially with COVID, I mean, domestic violence has gone up. I'm sure drug abuse and alcohol abuse have gone up they too. They say temp overdoses are up by 10%. I oh think we're gonna see that it's more. So, I mean, and keep in mind, every person, that's somebody's child. That's somebody's child. That was- and It also could be somebody's mother. Mother, daughter, child, uh, you know what I mean? Somebody loves that person. So yeah. that's the ripple effect of that is, is staggering. And um, I mean, but this was my perfect, sweet little daughter who, who was going through this, who I could, so easily could have lost. This is a, this is a young woman who stopped what she was doing in the middle of going between school and work and stopped at my house yesterday and brought me flowers. That's what kind of person that we don't care about. We care about her. <laughs> you care about her but I mean typically because I still do this you know what I mean I still help people like I did Gabe get into treatment walk them through this with with you know through the nonprofit. and I and I see that there's people that their families have abandoned them some I have people that have lost both parents to um to uh, overdoses mm. I I have you know people the that tough are love thing it's the tough love thing and I don't get that well, because I don't get it either. I think it's the worst thing you can do to somebody because here's somebody who feels the most unlovable they've ever felt in their whole life. And then the people that are supposed to love them turn their back on them. Yeah. You don't have to, you don't have to be overly reliant on a person and them over, really, overly reliant on you, which we call codependent, but we don't have to enable somebody. We don't have to do any of the things we can still love them though and, and let anyway, them know their such love. It's a funny thing. And it's so such a weird word too, but um, you know, that's, I worked really hard with my mom to talk to her properly, to have a good relationship to her to, and, um, <laughs> and then some people would say, no, you're just enabling her. I'm like, what do you mean I'm enabling her? So there's so many different visions of what you're doing, right? When we come to a situation, we see it through our vision and our eyes, and then someone else comes in from the side, they may be right or wrong, but they still have a different view of whatever it is. And I've heard so many people say, just leave them or I can't leave people in the street. It just doesn't make any sense. And, it, you know, the, the, the thing about it is, too, is this is there's, you know, and I deal with this all the time. But people say, oh, I, you know, I 
I paid for the phone and I know I shouldn't be doing that. Why shouldn't you be doing that? You want to get a phone call. I paid for my mm. daughter's phone for me, not for her. Mm. Right. Exactly. That wasn't why I, so I, I mean, and I talked to her every day. That was the deal. You have to call me and she would call and I would have text or call. I had the opportunity to tell her that I loved her every single day. So now that she's well, she looks back and she says, you never gave up on me. Yeah. You, I mean, there were things that we did that were harsh and that were hard for us too, but we did, we thought we were doing the right thing, but there was never a moment where she didn't feel loved. And it was never a moment where she felt given up on. And because the reality of this is this is a potentially fatal disease and some people do not get well, they mm. just don't, mm. they may use for the rest of their lives. So do we want to, we want to not have our loved one with us before they before anything happens to them because we're we have our beliefs and we won't allow it this is they're an individual if i if some people will have a child that is just not going to stop using drugs and so you should we let go of somebody if they have cancer i'm not going to love you anymore because you have cancer or I'm... smoke while they had cancer right if somebody has lung cancer and they continue oh. to smoke you're going to stop talking to them you know what I mean? It's, 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 or if they have diabetes and they continue to eat and you wish they would get well, but they don't, are you going to not love them anymore? I mean, it just, it I, doesn't. It does happen. I mean, my, my father had a heart transplant and the day he had a heart transplant, four other people had them. One of them was not expecting it. And um, so she wasn't psychologically prepared. It's something I didn't really think about it, but they prepared him psychologically. And we talked we children talked about it. My mom talked about it. That woman wasn't ready for it. Neither was her family. Her husband left her. She was in her mid forties. Poof. There goes her whole support. I mean, I can't imagine that, but there are people that that's the best they can do. And it's, <laughs> so we come back, right? We're talking about the value and the power and the strength of loving somebody, no matter where they are, the the mm -hmm. determination to believe in who that person really is underneath everything that we display outwardly, even what I'm showing to you now, you may like it and you may not, but still loving me as a human being. And some people can't do that. They can't peel off the layers and just accept whether it's cancer, whether it's a transplant, whether, yeah. you know, whether it's that the other person voted for somebody we don't like. I mean, it's such... There's so many ways that we write each other off and it makes no sense to me whatsoever because we are here sharing this world with each other. And the only way through it is by holding hands. I agree with you. But unfortunately, that's not always how we deal with this. So I hope that, you know, people will read the book and understand what, what you know, it, instead of having that preconceived idea of who this person is that's addicted to drugs and what their family must be like. Hopefully they'll get a better idea of, because I'm, t I'm much more typical of, of who this happens to than, than um, any preconceived idea of that I had even before all this started. I couldn't put it down, Maureen. Thank you. Really Thank you. Couldn't put it down. Well, hopefully the next book will be made up. I won't have to live it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You put a different kind of heart on your sleeve on the book, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Somebody else's. Thank you very much. <laughs> Maureen, thank you so much for sharing your story and your experiences. It's just heart wrenching that uh, the whole situation was just horrifying. Uh, it sounds exhausting, but somehow you had the courage and the determination to keep going. Uh, and I was particularly struck by a couple of things you said that uh, when this started, you did a lot of research to find out what is known in other people's experiences, and you asked a bunch of people. So that was a really great thing that uh, not everybody would think to do. And then uh, from the way you described it, your daughter was basically outed as being uh, a substance abuser addict. Uh, and given that, you chose to uh, be very public about it and to uh, respond to it in a very positive and loving way, which again, that's a choice. Not everybody would uh, choose to do that and not everybody would be capable yeah. of doing that. So thank you for sharing your really important story and uh, wow. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, I am actually can look at this now and think that I was very fortunate to have had this experience. It's helped other people, but also it's turned my daughter into the, like the most amazing person I know. She was always, I thought she always, always was, but she's become like even, even better now throughout the, through this guy after going through this. That's just great. I don't want to say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, so I would encourage if anybody's if if anybody's watching this, want to get in touch with me, they can find me. I have a, my website's MaureenCavanaugh.net. Um, MagnoliaNewBeginnings.org is where you can find all the support groups and the books available on Amazon and in bookstores if the bookstores are allowed to open. <laughs> mm. Amazon it, makes things so easy. It does. I think it's also available um, on dragonarts.com has a gift store now and I believe your book's available through that too. Awesome. And it's in libraries. I mean, I always tell people I'm not trying to I'm not <laughs> trying to sell a book if get it in the library. That's the oh, best place in the whole great. world, right? Pass it on. I actually went after I read it, I put it in my little library out front. So good. Good. Yeah, I'm constantly giving these away and you know, giving them to libraries when I speak. So Yes. So thank you all for coming and um I want to thank our donors to, whoops, I put up the wrong screen. <laughs> I put up our seasons instead of our donors. Oh, no, there we go. It is donors. Um, sweetie. It is donors. I'm sorry. So <clears throat> Tom Thibault, uh, Philip Thibault Architects, Bill and Lori Nabosny, Blue Shutters Web Design, the Massachusetts Cultural Council Grants, as administered by Bill Ricca Arts Council and the Drakett Cultural Council, Diane Song and Anonymous. If you're at all interested in um, donating, we can always use more funds to help pay our artists. So please just look us up on our website, drakeatarts.com. And pretty soon we will be back with um, our art gallery. And at four o'clock, we have a goodness, what are we having? We are having um, guitarist John Moratori. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you Thank so you much. So much yeah. Thank you.